Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Jason Freeman. Uh, I'm a producer and editor here in the Author Events Office, and uh, it's a great honor to be here to introduce uh, John Hendrickson. He is the author of a 2019 Atlantic article titled, What Joe Biden Can't Bring Himself to Say, an account of the president's and his own lifelong experience with stuttering. It was read by more than two million people, including multitudes of stutterers who responded with stories of their own journeys. A senior editor at The Atlantic, he wrote and edited for Rolling Stone, Esquire, and The Denver Post. And he has spoken about stuttering, politics, and journalism on a variety of media platforms and at universities across the country. He joins us tonight with his new book, Life on Delay, a memoir born from his Atlantic article and the deeper questions it raised for him. It delves into the wider personal, societal, and professional issues that can affect stutterers and their families. A review in the New York Times claims that all of this is seamlessly recounted, threading together science and emotion, ideas and experience, and that what Hendrickson writes about so beautifully is the movement to destigmatize the condition. Instead of trying to run away from it, some stutterers accept it uh, as a part of who they are. Tonight's author will be in conversation with Robert Coker. He is the author of Hidden Valley Road, the nonfiction account of a family's experience with schizophrenia, which was an instant number one New York Times bestseller and Oprah's book club selection, and was named a best book of the year by scores of media outlets. He is also the author of Lost Girls, one of Slate's best nonfiction books of the quarter century. Uh, a National Magazine Award finalist, his articles have appeared in Wired, the New York Times Magazine, and Bloomberg Business Week, among many other periodicals. So Philly, uh, I think you, uh, a lot of you know tonight's author, and welcome. And those of you who don't, I, it's my honor to be here to introduce John Hendrickson, uh, along with Robert Kolker. Thanks a lot for coming. I really appreciate it. I'm not going to read a chapter out of the my book um, because I don't want to keep us here till midnight. Um, <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just offer a few quick thank yous and then Bob and I will chat. Thank you to my family for all of your amazing love and support of this project. Thank you to my wife, who is around here, don't know exactly where, but is probably going to pop up at some point in take pictures. <laughs> uh, thank you to my publisher, Knopf, uh, for just amazing help with this entire project. Thank you to my agent, Molly Atlas, who gave me th this title. And thank you to Oliver Monday for uh, designing such a beautiful book jacket. Thank you to my friends, my old friends, new friends. Let's see some old Philadelphia friends here. Thank you a lot for being here. Uh, Thank you to my friends who friends who daughter. Um, two more here. I think we're done. Thank you to the library for hosting this. It's, it's an 
honor to just be up here. And of course, thank you to Bob, who, beyond being a number one New York Times bestseller and all those other accolades you heard, Bob is a person who answers a random email from a random aspiring writer and proceeds to offer me countless pieces of advice over the past few years and wrote an amazing blurb for the back of my book. And he took the Amtrak down from Brooklyn today to be here. So just thank you a million times, Bob. Thank you, and hello, everyone. It's, the honor is mine. This is, um, this is a joyous evening and a really special book. Um, so it's a, it's a thrill to be able to talk with you about it tonight and be the one asking you some questions. Tonight, uh, we'll spend about half the evening in conversation, and then the other half will open it up to, to questions from the floor. And before, but before I talk to John, I just thought I would share some of my own Im impressions about why I think Life on Delay is so special. Um, I, was, I was reading it for its material, obviously, and was, was deeply moved and you know, in tears when I read it in August and in tears again yesterday and today when I read it a second time. But, the, but I'm also reading it with an eye toward like, how, does, how does the book like this get made and how does it, it all come about? And I just saw so many different amazing things that John was doing at once that I just feel the need to call them out before we go in conversation. This book, as you know, began, or the project began, with John's piece about Joe Biden. The, the Biden story went viral. Um, John was on television. Uh, it started a lot of conversations, but it did more than that. It uncorked a torrent of sources for John, not just people who struggle with speaking all over the world, but his old kindergarten teacher, who first flagged his speech issues uh, as, a, as a kid, and other people from his own life, all resurfacing and coming to him in a very, very peculiar way. This doesn't happen ever, overnight to people. Um, you, uh, you saw the opportunity here. You started interrogating yourself and your own personal history of your own struggles. Um, in the book, he compares it to a book called Night of the Gun, which is an interesting comparison. This is a, a story by David, a true book by David Carr, a uh, departed journalist. But at the time, he was, he was investigating his own years of drug addiction. And he didn't remember those years very well, so he interviewed people from his past. John is doing the same thing. He interviews people from his past to reconstruct his own struggles in a, in not just like a memoir, but as a journalist. And that alone would be impressive. That, I think, is like big, big move number one that John did. But that's not it. And that's not all. And I mean, that, to me, there, there's some of these amazing moments. There's a comedian, Sherard, Sherard Small, I'm mangling the name, who, has a, who, um, who does some crowd work at a comedy club when John is there and singles out John, and it's a really, really ugly and terrible moment. John calls him up, has a conversation with him. At first, it seems to be going terribly wrong, and then suddenly it, it unleashes a whole new way of looking at that horrible situation. There are just layers upon layers here that I just had to appreciate. Um, but then something amazing happens because uh, all the people who came forward to speak with you, John, they, not, I'm, not, I'm talking now about people who struggle with speech, not, not the people from his own past. They offered you a window into a world, a realm of experience that no one has ever had access to in quite this way. It's a, a really special population of people who haven't really been able to talk with this level of candor and this level of detail about their lives. And John has them. He has them not just as someone who shares their struggle, but he has them as a writer, as a journalist. And he recognizes this. And I think any journalist can remember the two or three times in their career where you have something special that no one else has. And he does it. This is move number two. He, he broadens the book. 
the reporter in John recognizes that this can expand beyond a memoir and beyond a self-help book or a social science book or a health book. Life on Delay is constructed brick by brick as a work of destigmatization by talking not just about himself but about others. Just yesterday, Steve Silberman, who wrote Neurotribes, which is nominally a book about autism, but really it's a book about neurodiversity. He's probably the biggest spokesman for neurodiversity that I can think of out there. He called Life on Delay one of the best books on disability I've ever read. And there's a reason for that. It is a, it is a call for understanding. It is a call for destigmatization. Um, and that's not easy to pull off, to do a book that's personal about you, but also about a lot of other people. He's working two things at once. And none of it would be possible without the third big strength of the book, in my opinion, which is John's incredible ability to actually describe in writing the experience of struggling with speech in a way that really makes it come alive on the page and really drives it home for somebody who might never experience it themselves. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but for now, I just wanted to, um, I, I can launch into questions. I really, we'll get to a lot of the interviewing and journalisty stuff later, but I thought I would ask one big question coming forward. This is a hometown crowd, and your book is a beautiful family story. Uh, what was it like to interview members of your own family? Great question. Tough one off the bat. <laughs> but I'm smiling, so that's all good. <laughs> it was an amazing experience. I think it was among the most transformative, powerful conversations of our lives. You know... I asked my family, my parents, and my older brother a crazy question, which was, can we sit down and talk about the totality of life, about the good, the, the bad, everything in between? And can I put a, a tape recorder between us? And can I eventually write about all this in a book? And all three of them said, yes, absolutely. We will do whatever we can to support you in this project. And it was just an amazing helpless gift that they gave not only me, but my hope is other families. Um, and I, I know it's early in the night, but can we just give my family a round of applause for that? Um, wonderful. And then, and then there are others here, not just family, who are close to you from your past. This book. You know, you're not, this isn't your first time back in Philadelphia. You know, you, you came back to work, come back all the time, but you came back to work on the book as well, and it brought you back in touch with people in Philadelphia. I thought we might talk about some of those folks who um, I believe are here tonight. Um, I can, uh, I, I, we've talked about a couple people who will be here. I'll start with, um, uh, with Joe Donaher. Did I say yeah. that correctly? Yeah. Is Joe, you here? Raise your hand. Hi, Joe. Hey, Joe. <laughs> Joe. Joe was John's high school speech therapist, and really uh, had was was an early experience in John in learning to manage his stutter. I thought I'd ask you to ask. Maybe you could. Yeah. John, do you, if it, yes. we'd love to ask you a question or. Well, maybe I'll embarrass Joe for a sec and then <laughs> call, call, call him out, but. Part of this book is the 
journey of my mom and I going to many different therapists over the course of my life. Everything from a classic fluency shaping therapist as a young kid. Fluency is just a fancy word for smooth speech. To a hypnotherapist when I was like 13, I would wow. go down to this man's basement and he would <laughs> hook up these wires and things to me and he would record these tapes, cassette tapes that I had to listen to every night that was like, you are talking smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> to eventually when my family moved up to Philadelphia when I was entering high school, my mom, who is a total saint, never gave up. And she found Joe Donaher, who works at Children's Hospital not too far from here, and Joe was the f first th therapist I ever met or ever worked with who um, he said, I'm not going to teach you to talk smoothly. I'm going to teach you to... Stutter better. I'm going to teach you to manage your stutter, and I'm going to work with you to break out of these avoidance behaviors. Because at the at the time, I was avoiding basic <laughs> fundamental things like ordering off a restaurant menu. <laughs> so Joe is in this book, and I appreciate you a lot. Thank you, Joe. Um, there is also Jim McKay um, from Penn, a professor of psychiatry who's been in touch um, lately. J uh, Jim, are you here? Oh, great to see you tonight. Um, uh, Jim is in the section of the book that talks about a little bit about recovery and substance abuse and, um, and self-medicating when through the you know, anxiety of struggling with speech. Jim is one of the roughly uh, 1,000 people who sent me letters and emails and messages in the wake of my Biden article. And Jim's just immediately popped out in me because of the, the depth of everything he was expressing and, and the rawness of it and the honesty. You know, this was the very first time me and him had ever corresponded and he told me his life story and told me about his journey with substance abuse and recovery and the way that the, those issues can kind of be woven into being a person who stutters. And the more and more people who I interviewed, who I talked to, the more that that idea kept coming up. So Jim and I not only uh, 
traded emails, but then we began multi-hour conversations that took place over the course of the many months, and then we got to know each other in person. And uh, Jim's whole chapter in the book, I think, is one of the most important. I see. I think it's it's conversations like that, as you rep as you portray them in the book, that make it uh, make the book sort of lift off and become what what could be a, a very very you know sad book or a book full with with grievance. Actually, becomes a window into a community of people who are struggling to be understood. And so your act of understanding them and of, of getting their stories across to the reader is kind of exhilarating. You, you suddenly you feel like a light is shining on, on people who have really been hiding in plain sight. Um, that I think is a is an amazing accomplishment. But let's but let, let's get to the the nitty gritty of the, you know the experience of struggling with speech, which is something you get across, so well. Um, at, at one point. Very early on, you talk about how it's like um, how blocking, which is one way of stuttering, is like trying to push two positively charged magnets together. So you, you immediately start to feel exactly just how impossible the task can feel. Um, I know you said you don't want to read, but I wondered if it was okay for me to read one particular passage about what it's like to travel through the world uh, struggling with speech. Absolutely. This is the part of the book where um, John introduces a concept known as the look. The look is almost always the same. It's the moment the listener realizes something is wrong with you. That moment they subtly wince. They don't know whether to interject or to keep waiting while you try and fail to speak. They probably don't sense their shoulders rising, their head pulling away in discomfort. It's primal, this reaction another body literally retreating from you, the problem. Even during the chaos of a stutter, you see it, all of it, the judgment, the pity, the why does he talk like this expression. No matter how many years pass, no matter how, no matter how numb you become, the look never leaves you. I've received the look from parents, priests, school teachers, bosses, friends, and girlfriends. The look stalked playgrounds when I was young and it was waiting for me behind the bar when I got older. Flight attendants and baristas and counter guys at the pizza place near my apartment throw me the look. I get it from colleagues and neighbors and strangers at birthday parties. I don't blame them. You, you may have given someone the look yourself, and I don't blame you. Odds are that you're part of the 99% of the population who don't stutter, but if you're among the 1% of the people in the world who do, then I don't need to explain the look to you. Someone gave you the look earlier this morning. Someone else will give you the look before you go to bed tonight. The look is one reason people who stutter look away. I found this to be such a powerful um, section, and I, I, I must ask, you know, have you gotten the look today? Or Sorry for bumming everybody <laughs> out with that passage. <laughs> Um, but uh, and yet it's so universal. Well, I want to I want to pivot off that question. Are there any other people who people who stutter um, here tonight? Um, in the past week, raise your hand if you've gotten. The look. So that's why I, I wrote this. You know, I didn't write it to make uh, non stutterers feel bad about themselves. I just wrote it because it's a real thing that happens. And that was my North Star with this entire book, just to try to be as real and authentic as I possibly could. 
it's an it's emotionally problematic thing to bring up in a book because um, because there's anger in that in, in in the discussion of the look. Very early in the book, you talk about you say how do you make peace with the shame of stuttering? Uh, what do you do with the anger, the resentment, the fear? How do you accept an aspect of yourself that you're taught at such an early age to hate? Just look at those words: shame, anger, resentment, fear, hate. You know what's exciting about this book is that it it doesn't stay there for long. It moves forward. That it talks about coping strategies. It talks about it talks about the you know the love that can you know emerge from relationships and, and finding community. Um, uh, there is um, you know one particular person who stutters who who you interview John named Lyle, who, who's a guitarist. And he talks about the endless coping strategies and different things that he does to try to, you know, make his way through the day. And you just get a sense of just how exhausting it can be uh, to try to avoid the look, to try to, or negotiate the look, or to try to um, not even be in a situation where the look might exist. He talks about being at, um, a backstage after a show and not talking to anyone rather than actually milling around with people. And that's a coping strategy. But, then, then there's, he says something very um, insightful that's really kind of trenchant. I think it really, um, and it's witty, and I think it, it gets at the absurdity of the task at hand here that he's trying to do. He says, I'm trying to overcome it, and it's kind of killing me. But the reality is, it's not actually killing me, and I'm not really overcoming it. <laughs> right? So that, it's That's absurd. my it's a, it's favorite a, quote in the whole book. Right. <laughs> Right, so you know the, what you have isn't killing you, right? But and yet it feels like death a couple times a day, right? You know, it, it's rough. So it's it's bizarre, it, deeply bizarre, and it's and it's happening in plain sight. And the people you love the most might not understand it. So that that's the challenge here. It's really it's quite something. And th th that exact dynamic that you described just there kept coming up in. Virtually every conversation, every interview that I did in this book, I did over 100 interviews, and you know the people from all different walks of life, all different backgrounds, ages, all different countries, and that universality of everything you just said kept coming up again and again and again and again, which kind of blew my mind. And I don't know what the answer is other than to try to articulate it as, as perfectly, as beautifully as Lyle did there. There is, of course, you know, a condition, it is a physical condition to be discussed. And this is not a hard science book. And yet John is really able to get across some of the essential um, the, the quagmire that is speech therapy for stuttering. And, and he arrives at, at uh, one, one expert, uh, Courtney Bird is her name, mm -hmm. in Austin, who really kind of is an insurgent who sort of steps up and tells the entire, practically the entire speech therapy world that they're doing it wrong. I thought I'd ask you a little bit about that. I think of Dr. Bird kind of like Aaron Brockovich. <laughs> and uh, again, the, the, what Bob just described literally occurred at the National Stuttering Association Conference in 2021 uh, down in Austin, Texas. And it was a ballroom of, you know, I'd say roughly 500 people. And it was, it was a lot of people who stutter, but a lot of researchers, a lot of uh, SLPs, which is speech language pathologists. And Dr. Bird's up on stage giving the keynote, and she basically tells her peers and colleagues, you're committing malpractice. Dr. Bird 
received a $30 million grant from Arthur Blank, who is the founder of Home Depot and the owner of the Atlanta Falcons, and is a person who stutters. And he, he gave her this money to establish this pioneering center down at UT Austin. And, you know, usually if you get those kind of big checks, I'm picturing like a big, like, Price is right to check or something. <laughs> Usually, if you get those, it comes with this like big, heavy handed mission statement like, end stuttering, cure stuttering. And Dr. Bird, whenever um, Dr. Bird begins working with a new patient or a new family, the very first thing she says is, there is no cure for stuttering. No cure. no cure. So then what? So then the, the, the idea is to, as you say, make peace, right? That's the, the way through? To build up a person's desire to communicate at all, to work on things like eye contact, just the basic confidence to pick up a telephone, to order off a restaurant menu, to walk into class on the first day of ninth grade and you're going around the introductions up and down the rows and when it gets to you to say, I'm a person who stutters, this is gonna take me a minute and then you introduce yourself. Needless to say, that is not what my first day of ninth grade was like. <laughs> and uh, one of my teachers, Mr. Braithwaite, is here. It's just like this is your life. Everybody's here. <laughs> I interviewed him in the book, and I asked him about that day. And, I mean, can I ask you about this right now? Can I hand you the mic, and can you tell everybody what that day was like? Sure. Hi, I'm Tony Braithwaite. <laughs> Hi, Tony. Um, I was John's freshman year religion teacher, um, and every year, as John said, I would on the first day of class, go around and ask everybody to stand and say who they are and where they were from and an interesting fact about themselves. And obviously this was a little different when we got to John and I could instantly tell, John recounts this in the book better than I'm going to now because <laughs> I'm also a puddle of nostalgia and pride <laughs> as I stand here. Uh, and John got up and was incredibly brave, but the molecules in the room changed. Because the kids, and nobody knows each other anyway on the first day, so it's already an awkward situation that this idiot teacher decided to unwittingly make even more awkward for this guy. And as John describes in the book, all the heads turned to me to look at me as if to say, you started this, what are you gonna do about this? And I could only call on my acting skills, which were a lot better that day than they are now, because <laughs> I'm filled with nostalgia and I'm a puddle of pride. And I thought the best thing I can do for this guy at this point is to pretend that the molecules are not changing, and that everything is good, and that the kids might take their cue from me. But I'm also, another part of my brain is praying that I'm doing right by this student at this moment. And another part of my brain is, going, is saying, you're not doing right for the, by this student. You're screwing this up, too. And this is all happening in about 35 seconds. Mm. But it created, I think, uh, I, I wanted to know this person even greater because even at that moment, I went, there's an inner life here that is really worth exploring. I can't wait to know who this guy is. 
Um, and he failed the course, but we'll get into that another time. <laughs> Back to you. Thank you. So, but we had Mr. Braithwaite here and John as well. We did not plan that, by the way. We did, we, this was not planned. We, I, we're getting ready for audience questions, and that's a good segue, but I did have one. I thought I'd follow up on that. So if there was a, a student today who was the age you were then, in, in today's world, is, it, it, are they in a world where there's been some progress, the same way that there's been progress in talking about things like anxiety or, I don't know, autism? They're, they're, the, the, back when I was a kid, you wouldn't talk about those things in school. Now, you know, it's all my kids talk about in school. Honestly, your work and people like uh, Steve Silberman and Andrew Solomon and activists like Alice Wong have pushed our understanding of mental health forward, but also just disability and disorders and neurological issues and have brought it out of the shadows where people are talking about any number of issues. For whatever reason, the topic of stuttering has perpetually been kind of off stage, and it it has always been uncomfortable. And you know, like we have a a president who president who stutters, but it's uncomfortable still. And I think I think any time any person talks about the way. Biden talks, it's uncomfortable still. And I don't know what it's going to take to bring this particular disorder to a place closer to neutrality. And things like OCD and anxiety and depression carry a stigma, but not the same intense a stigma that they may have two decades ago. Well, this this book certainly feels like a great step forward in the right direction. So does a, a night like tonight, and and I, I'd love to keep the um, keep the party going. And Can I say just before we kick off, is is there a, a person who stutters who wants to ask the first question? Hello, everyone. My name is. R Raja Vedia, and as you can tell, sometimes it's hard to say my own name, which is kind of funny. Um, John, uh, one of my growing up, um, I went through a lot of speech therapy, a lot of different tactics, strategies. I've tried the, there's a fluency master device attached to your ear. I've gone to the SUNY Geneseo Starbucks fluency clinic for four weeks of intensive training, and um, many, many different strategies to try to become more fluent. And over time, um, one of the things that uh, what you were just talking about was that I'm gro 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 growing up, um, how it wasn't considered to be normal to have a speech speech to have a speech impediment. Uh, whereas now, like you said, just like autism or depression or anxiety, it's it's becoming a little bit more normalized and okay. Um, and my question is about one thing growing up I saw all the time. And I don't know if any of you have all seen this as well, is that Hollywood portrays people with a speech impediment in one of two ways. In about nine out of ten movies I've seen, you're either the, the, the uh, 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 villain or the fool. And think about it. In Harry Potter, Professor Quirrell ended up being Voldemort. Right? In the most recent Star Wars movie, uh, Benicio Del Toro's... Uh, character has a has a speech impediment and as soon as I saw the theater I, I saw the movie in the theater with my friends I said great he's going to betray the rebels and, then, <laughs> and, and unfortunately that's what happened so Hollywood seems to get away with this so um, one thing that I would ask everyone not just 
John and your book and everybody else is that um, take a look at what are our unconscious biases against something like this and think, is that really normal? And I hope that, uh, am I am I question to you, John, is that, you know, what do you think that we could do to put pressure on making this a more normal uh, part of our society and life? Thank you. Great question, thank you. And I write about exactly what you're talking about in the book, the Hollywood depiction of stuttering and the way that that has uh, molded our understanding of it. I talked to an actor who stutters named Alex Brightman about representation of not only this uh, disorder, but any number of disabilities. Usually, if you see a disabled character appear on screen, they are defined totally by their disability. It's very, very rare to see a character in a wheelchair who just happens to be in a wheelchair, and the other characters don't comment on it. So I think it's, it's going to take a while for uh, writers in Hollywood to get past that. But it's, it's just kind of this very slow period of uh, normalization. Hey, John. Um, I asked you a couple months ago um, how you were uh, uh, feeling about uh, uh, going on this uh, book tour. Um, and you said you were like a little uh, stressed out about it, I think you said. Um, just a is, little. Just a little. <laughs> um, I think uh, this is like the fourth stop out of like eight or ten or something. Um, just wondering like how it's going and uh, what it's uh, been like because uh, he said uh, it's, it's like. Uh, uh, this is your life, <laughs> and it must be kind of uh, surreal, almost. Um, and as well, the public uh, speaking aspect. So, I was wondering if you could uh, talk about that. Being on stage, under lights, talking into a microphone, was. Literally, my nightmare. <laughs> and like, I'm not using that as like a metaphor. Like, it was a nightmare, like, it was a nightmare that I had. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. So it's it's just like turn my entire life upside down. I I can't even describe the magnitude of, of the change, and. You know, I'm, I'm terrified every night. Or, or Bob and I were backstage, and I'm like, you know, eight mile Eminem, like, oh my God, I'm going to puke. Like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just terrified every single night. But um, it's, it's an honor that, that you all would come out on a cold Tuesday night in January. You could be anywhere and you're here and it's an honor that anybody's remotely interested in my book or that the library is interested enough to do this event for Bob and I. So my answer is just to roll with it and it's it's like not a, a thing I look I look forward to like when my wife and I and 
Bob were taking uh, the Amtrak down today, and as we keep getting uh, closer and closer and closer to Philly, I'm like, oh God, oh God, oh God. <laughs> so it's not a thing I look forward to, but it's just it's just happening. That's kind of all I can say. But my my f favorite part and the, the thing that kind of is the most meaningful is meeting other people who stutter and talking to other people who stutter and listening to other people who stutter uh, talking to microphones as well. The, the, there's a green room here at the library that we were just introduced to moments ago and it has photos of like Toni Morrison, like the, the greatest, the greatest <laughs> people in literature and it, that's a bit of a mind game right there. They're, they're staring at you saying don't screw up. Hello, Joan. Uh, I'm Max Roy. I'm a sophomore who currently goes to your alma mater, St. Joe's Prep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you think are the next steps uh, that me and us as community can take to try and destigmatize de stuttering in uh, this, what's called all together? Great question. Um, can I ask like an uncomfortable question back? Like, do you uh, uh, know any person who stutters? Uh, well, personally, uh, growing up, I was uh, I was diagnosed with a speech impediment growing up. So, I believe from pre-K to about fifth grade, I, I went through speech therapy. Um, I do know a couple people with it, and. Uh, I personally knew what it was like growing up in a large segmentation around uh, going to speech therapy, having a stutter, you know, <laughs> young kids are me. Yeah. The very best thing I think that you and your high school friends could do for peers who stutter is to just treat them normally, totally normally. And that is a little more difficult than it sounds because it doesn't mean uh, be extra nice to them, you know, pat them on the head, coddle them. And obviously it doesn't mean um, bully them or be an asshole to them, but just treat them like literally any other kid in the hallway, and uh, that's enough, I think. Uh, hello, my name is Seth Slater. I also go to St. Joe's Prep, and my question for you is, how frustrated do you get when you know what you want to say and then you can't say it? And then what do you do like to ease the, your frustration when you can't say it? Nothing is more frustrating than that. To me, writing has been an answer because I think, of, I think all of us have the voice in our head, and we have the voice that we uh, talk with. And when you're a person who stutters, those two voices are at war with each other. But writing is like the secret answer. Well, I'm here because because my granddaughter, who's a stutterer, just met you in in Boston. Okay. What was her name? Rebecca. Uh, oh yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember. It's, okay. it's working. The tour is working. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Viral marketing. <laughs> <laughs> I've been stuttering all of my life. I'm 86. And uh, my stuttering has sort of went in, in the background, okay? 
Uh, I went to speech, speech therapist. My mother took me to the child's the guidance uh, uh, in, in Philadelphia. They thought I was mentally defective, okay? Uh, and, uh, and what happened, I grew up in a great neighborhood where everybody had, had your back. If I stuttered and, and, and somebody, you know, knew in the neighborhood or uh, was, was visiting, the other, other kids in the, in the neighborhood would beat the hell out of them, okay? <laughs> and that worked very well. <laughs> uh, but on stuttering, that all the therapists had, had no effect on me. So I finally found in, in engineering it's something called a workaround, all right? It's something who, who, who normally you know, works on a computer or something, and it stops. You try to figure out another you know, method of, of getting the same result. And uh, what I did, I... I know exactly what you're talking about. You're in in a class, and, and and the teacher asked everybody what their name is. Well, that would make me like absolutely petrified. But what I did, I found out I had a hard time in in starting. But once I started, it went kind of smoothly. So I had a mechanical a pencil. The thing was called, called a scripto. That you put your lead in there and every time you needed a bit more, you would, would, would put your thumb and a little bit more, more lead would, would pop out and would make a click. Well, when I got stuck, I would have this pencil in my pocket, and my hand in my pocket, and if I was stuck, I would hit that little click, and the word would come out. And that was my, my workaround, okay? And I used that for a long time. Now, obviously, I used an awful lot of lead, okay? <laughs> but it did work to have that workaround, okay? And unfortunately, none of the speech therapists I went to gave that as a recommendation, that you need a workaround. And that workaround helped me, and then I went into my, my own business, and I was at an Academy of Ophthalmology meeting. I, I made that type of thing, and it was my first your customer. I had to describe what I made and how it works. And at that time, I had, had two little kids and a wife and house payments. And it was as if there was, was somebody else inside of me speaking, okay? It wasn't me moving my mouth. There was another your person in... Uh, inside and I became very successful in that. Every time I would meet, meet a customer, I would have my, my little pencil and if I got stuck on the first word, that popped out. Hmm. That's my story. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. And, 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 and anybody who is, is a stutterer, if somebody makes, makes fun of you, you call him a schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good it's a good subject workarounds you discuss it a bunch of different ways not just about yourself but at one point you mentioned Samuel Jackson deploys workarounds he, when he speaks in public to avoid situations where he might stutter it, it's a big subject right maybe you could talk a little bit about it that's uh, the origin of this. F-bombs. That's why he began putting them in. 
<laughs> workarounds or secondary behaviors, they're a bit like uh, putting chewing gum on a crack of a uh, Hoover Dam. You know, it's going to hold it for a little bit, but it, it's not going to take care of it for the rest of the time. And w w research indicates that they become muscle memory and they can evolve into uh, ticks. And many people who stutter develop these secondary behaviors. I mean, one of them is loss of eye contact, as I just did. What Dr. Bird and people like uh, Joe Donaher are, are preaching is just letting yourself uh, be a person who, person who stutters. And it's OK if your speech is kind of, kind of up and down, but if you're getting out the sentences you're trying to say, that's all that matters in the end. Um, hi, um, I'm Soren Bungard. Um, I'm from Central High School. Um, I've been stuttering since I can remember. Um, but for me, it was actually easier to accept myself as a transgender person than it was as a person who stutters. Um, and I was kind of wondering if that step of acceptance for you as a person who stutters made other things in life e easier for you? Great question. One of my favorite people in this book and one of my favorite people I've met in the entire community of people who stutter is Barry uh, Yeoman, who is a man who stutters, and he f founded this LGBTQ organization called Passing in Twice. And Barry is in his mid 60s, I would guess, I don't know his exact age. Barry told me that it was easier to come out as a gay man than it was coming out as a person who stutters. And he told me that coming out as a gay man helped him eventually make peace with his disfluency. And, and there's plenty of other wisdom from him in here, but um, that's a lesson I've really taken to heart, and I've, I've just learned many things from him. Thank you for your question. That's a wonderful question. Um, I think, like, I think the the best the best nonfiction I always think li lifts the veil on a world that you have never, not only a world you may not know anything about, but the world that you may not even have known existed, whether it's a geographical location or a community of people. And we really have John to thank for for the window that he offers us all. So I want to end by thanking the Free Library and also thanking John. Thank you.